Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews, ah, not interviews, conversations. Conversations. We've changed it because <laughs> that's what they are with spiritually awakening people. Um, I've done over 500 of them now. And if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B A T G A P, and look under the past interviews menu where you'll see them organized in several different ways. If you appreciate this show and feel like supporting it, we appreciate that. That's what makes it possible for us to do this. Um, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site and uh, also a page which explains other ways of supporting it other than PayPal. So my guest today is Tom Kur Kurska. That's the right pronunciation, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, you got it right, Kurska. Kurska, mm -hmm. good. Um, and uh, Tom lives out in Eugene, Oregon, and has an interesting story, which we'll be getting into. Um, I'll just read a little bit of his bio that he sent me. Uh, over his lifetime, Tom has dived deeply into inner work while simultaneously living a householder life. Through an ongoing revelation of living in the moment, he integrates the insights of the most sophisticated Western developed psychologies with the ongoing intuitive consciousness with which he has been blessed since the year 2000. Tom uses these skills and this wisdom to guide those dedicated and willing to go courageously inward, often finding and releasing blocks to spiritual awakening, which originated in earliest, often pre-verbal childhood. <clears throat> After being asked to teach, who asked you to teach, Tom? Um, several. Um, Joel Morewood in 2000, and then um, a subsequent, um, oh, some people here cornered me one day and <laughs> had me teach after I had left the center. Um, and then um, another teacher I worked with on the childhood issues, um, David G. David Waldman, oh, also good. suggested I teach. So they, they keep cornering me, Rick. I can't help myself. I, I've never myself gone after it. It just comes to me. They say, we have ways of making you teach. Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> it. So anyway, Joel Moorhood has been on BatGap. If people want to look him up, probably Tom will be talking about him during the interview. But um, after having been asked to teach, Tom has been sharing this work for over 19 years. His sessions give attendees a taste of what he exudes, a patient, tender love that is our true interconnected nature. His focus on connection to the immediacy of felt sensation enables potent transformations to readily manifest. His work and presence is an acknowledgement that our beautiful, imperfect human condition is completely embraced by the wide openness of life itself, even when the most uncomfortable aspects of ourselves appear. Do you do, you do any teaching uh, remotely, like over Skype or webinars or anything? Is it all just local in the Eugene area? Um, no, I, I go over Skype. I have a um, group in Charlottesville, Virginia that um, I go out there twice a year, but monthly we meet over Skype. And then um, also I, I go on um, Open Circle on occasion out of Berkeley. Um, and by the way, I, I want to plug Open Circle a little bit. They're, they're a great outfit. They have a lot of teachers that go online. They've been very, very supportive in this work. Yeah, I'm friends with the people who are sort of like Kent Walsh and people in yeah. different areas of Open Circle right. around the Bay Area. <clears throat> yeah, they're good people. So check them yeah. out yeah um so they're, they're giving online uh, things now as well as local in in the bay area yeah yeah there's always an online thing again basically it's format no lot of conversation um you know interaction and, it's like uh, a zoom call or something like a zoom yeah they use zoom so usually the sessions go two hours and you know pamela wilson Jeannie zandy is on there um those are the two names i can think of sure okay good um so just to finish up your bio here so throughout your life you've worked in numerous jobs in multiple disciplines from basic minimum wage to corporate executive from grade school teacher to construction contractor from graphic designer to writer You've been married to your wife, Dawn, for almost 40 years, and you have a daughter. Okay. So, um, as I recall, having read a more detailed bio on your website, you began to have inklings of that there was something more to life um, from quite an early age. Um, so maybe let's start there and then see how it unfolds. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, well, I'll, I'll start with um, three things. Now, the first one, as a little kid, maybe three, four, hard to say, <laughs> I can recall sitting in my grandma's sort of enclosed back porch, and there was the windows were behind me, and I would look into this blue-tinted mirror, which would reflect the trees and the sky behind me that are coming through the window, right? And I would, as a kid, I would just stare. I mean, a three-year-old just staring like that, not getting busy, busy, busy. So you're actually looking at the window, but seeing the reflection of the trees and yeah. the stuff that were behind right. you. It, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at the mirror and seeing a reflection of the trees behind me in the mirror. And it has that blue tint. I don't think that blue tint's really relevant, but that's what it is. And I would sit there just entranced by the trees waving in the space of the sky. And it wasn't until 2000 when all of a sudden I had this shift in perspective that I realized what that little boy was looking at. You know, the, the child, we, we don't have the cognitive ability to go, oh, I am feeling myself as the space, as the trees, as they wave through the space. That isn't there. You're just it, right? And so we forget that. But so I would, um, when that came back in 2000, went, oh my gosh, because I was having the same experience then. It was like, my gosh, I look at the trees and the clouds and I can feel myself as those. It's like I feel myself as part of those. It's like the separation is ended and yet I can still be separate and be that separate one as it waves through the sky or whatever. So there was that. And then maybe at age seven or so, I would look in a mirror and, you know, always looking at mirrors, right? So I'm looking at this mirror in the bathroom and I would just start looking at it and basically I wouldn't know who I was anymore. It was like the, the thought came, I don't exist. And for a minute, you know, everything sort of shifted. My whole life wasn't my life. It was like I was just here. And the third one that I remember so that's sort of like feeling the spacious sort of presence, presence, the spacious quality. The third one was there was one time when I was my I I I was a pretty good kid. I didn't really raise a lot of fuss, but for some reason this day, my my grandmother, my grandparents lived two doors down from my parents in Chicago. You know, we lived in these flats, these two 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 story flats, and so. My parents, they had us when we were, they were pretty young, so they would shove us off on the grandparents so they could go party or something because all their friends were childless, right? <laughs> and so we were at grandma's house, and all I remember was I was being a brat, and she's, she's, I'm sitting in a chair, and she's putting on my shoes to put me outside, and every time she touched my leg to put my shoe on, it would hurt. And grandma at the time, she had some pain in her arms or in her body. I don't know if it's arthritis kicking up or she, you know, if she was sick or something. Every time she touched me, it would hurt me. And the response was I would kick because it hurt so bad. In other words, so you're I feeling was, her pain. You're I was feeling her it. pain as my pain in my body, right? I was completely enmeshed yeah. in that. And then, of course, you know, she threw me outside. My father came in the backyard and picked me up and took me, you know, flung me over his shoulders to take me home. It wasn't like he was being mean, but, you know, I was being a bad kid. I wasn't being yeah. grandma. And I just remember, you know, hanging over his shoulders in the back, just watching the ground. But <laughs> the, the point was, I was reprimanded from really, really feeling everything at this visceral level. And so that shut down. Uh. And that's the point. We, we come in able to do that. And because, you know, what parents do, the environment do, we start to shut down. It was like, no, it's not okay to do that. What does a little kid do with that when they're feeling the immense pain all around them? At some point, you learn to shut down. Yeah. So those were early experiences that I had as a child. Something, something was, you know, what? No, knew it. I, I think most really young children do have these tastes more or less i think they do and um maybe even all of them at some point you know but you know i think probably it gets overshadowed 
to you know varying degrees at, at varying points in their early lives you know some probably very quickly and and heavily others maybe it takes a while longer and not so heavy but you know kind of the people i talk to on this show many of them have memories of early you know childhood unity consciousness and you know celestial perception where they're seeing angels or something or um, all kinds of stuff um, but then almost universally it begins to be lost as they you know approach the age of eight or nine or ten or something and um, you know they may or may not go through a wild teenage phase and and then usually in the late teens or so they they start to have this yearning to regain that you know and they start working at it consciously yeah yeah i think that's the common human experience we come in we're this wide open vessel and then we forget and then we have to remember again to see we really never lost it we just got covered over yeah and of course most people don't ever get around to doing that but the, you know i have i'm sort of speaking to a select subset with, <laughs> with this yeah. show and the types of people who actually maybe the the experience was so profound or maybe the the overshadowment was a little bit less intense and so for one reason or another the desire to to regain it gets reignited and they you know get onto some spiritual path and lo and behold eventually regain it right yeah so in your case um you know as you're saying a, a lot of this stuff shut down when you were getting into you know as you were growing up um at what point did you you know have the the inclination to um you know start seeking or re reawaken it well i think you know the um looking in the bathroom mirror with that i i you don't exist you know you don't exist that that one unlike the you know looking at the clouds in the mirror or grandma you know that one that one stayed with me mm. it was like all along you know i still play the game of life would do what a kid does get in trouble do good things do good in school whatever that was always i i never forgot that one it was like there was something in there that said oh there there's more to this there's something that um, missing. And I think it was around age 12, 13, middle school, you could say, that I found, um, you know, kind of sort of academic books on Buddhism. I don't know how I came across it and started reading some of that and went, oh, the, you know, because I was brought up a Lutheran. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, you know, God was like the big daddy in the sky. And you know, there was Jesus, but Jesus was like the big daddy in the sky and, you know, all the Bible stories and everything. And I couldn't relate this experience, this experience, that, you know, when we're talking about religion and God, it's like, well, this is, this feels like this is God. And I couldn't, you know, make the leap to go, well, what are these Christians talking about here? It's just yeah. not computing with this immediate experience I'm having, right? So, um, so I ran across this Buddhism book and it was like this, you know, what they're talking about, there's no self, it's nirvana, there's just, just this now or whatever. And I don't think the language was that clear. And I thought, oh, oh, well, this kind of relates to what I, what is my experience, right? So it got me interested in the Eastern religions. That's cool. Around the age of 12-ish. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of impressive at that age. <laughs> well, I was a bookish kind of guy, yeah. introverted, you know. <laughs> when you say you never really forgot this sort of taste of you don't exist, was it that you didn't forget the memory of having had that experience? Or was there always something in your experience that you could sort of reflect on and say, yeah, it's still here? Well, it, it would happen off and on. Yeah, yeah, so it was there, but you Keep know, maybe more obscured, but the intellect would go, you know, when it came up, it's like there's it it would remember, it would relive that experience. Yeah. Or the experience would happen again in the mirror. I go, well, let's check out the mirror again. And sure enough, mm -hmm. oh, there it is. You don't exist again. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, you know, the thing I always focused on, but it was it was there in the back room. It was deep set. Yeah. You know. You ever talk to friends about it when you were a kid? 
No, I never talked to anybody about it because I couldn't describe it myself. Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't anyone there to talk, you know, that could relate to that. I don't know. just, I stayed quiet. Again, I was kind of a shy kid, you know, yeah. I did. You know, I, I could, I could, when I, when I started getting a little crazy, you know, the teacher would, every time I did something troublesome, I always got reprimanded. I always got set on the straight and narrow again, <laughs> <laughs> which is a good thing. Oh, yeah. Um, so then, as, as I recall your story, one of the next most significant milestones was you took LSD when you were a kid, or was there something before that that we should cover? Um, well, there, there was one more piece I want to go over when I was maybe in first grade, which I think is relevant, because I always like to decipher between being the um, feeling yourself as the space. How so? I how I see it is sort of like you're driving down a road and it's foggy, but the fog is only up to like your the hood at the top of the hood of your car, so you can see over the fog. So there, there's two ways we can experience it. We can be more in the space and we can sort of override, you know, this visceral physical pain. And I was very good at that as a kid. The, the example I'm giving is I was in first grade. And again, I got in trouble. I, there was an outside drinking fountain during our lunch break. And I loaded my mouth up with water and I spit it on this other kid or little <laughs> Jimmy, you know. <laughs> I don't know why I did it. I thought it was funny. It wasn't that kind of kid. Every so often this mischievousness would get in me. And so I had I forgot about it, right? So I come back in after lunch and um Mrs. Sauve, the first grade teacher, she says, you know, you come with me because the kids mother called her up and said, Tom Kurska, you know, did this to my kid, right? She takes me to the janitor's closet and she has the yardstick and she starts beating my butt, you know, first kind of gently. And my experience was, it was almost like I was up in the ceiling, you know, not exactly, but I was up in the ceiling. It was like, I just watching this and, you know, the, all the brunt force, he's, he's hitting me and there's the physical pain and, you know, the emotional pain that she's reprimanding me. I was just like calm up there, like, yeah whatever. And so she starts hitting me harder and harder. She wants to get me to cry, right? Yeah. Huh. I don't know that at the time, but then she gives up because she can't get it. You know, here's this, you know, six years old getting beat by a yardstick and the kids just sort of sitting there like taking it. <laughs> Not denying it's there, but it's sort of like he's overriding it. And so I... She says then at the end, she stops hitting me because she realizes she can't make me cry. And she says, well, when you go back in that classroom, I want to make sure that you come back in there and you cover your face and your eyes like this and you go down on the desk like you're crying. (laughs) That's funny. She didn't want the other kids to think that uh, she wasn't tough enough. (laughs) Well, she wanted to make sure I was really punished and I, you know, whatever. Uh, Set an example, yeah. And so I just wish as a kid, you know, I, I mean, today, a kid today would probably go in there and go like this and then sit down at the desk and start laughing or something. Oh, these days the teacher would be fired for doing that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just wish I would have, you know, because I'm going, why is she make, you know, as a kid, you don't understand these things. You don't, yeah, it's yeah. like, she want me to do that, but mm-hmm. you listen, you know. Interesting. So, so the point being is that, um, where it was going, the next significant thing that I always like to differentiate between someone that can, you know, can be spaciously present, but they're not totally here as a human. They're not totally feeling the whole thing. Just like with the grandma saying, I'm feeling her pain as my pain, you know, felt sense wise, not just spaciously. So the next um, experience was, yeah, the LSD experience. So I had, we've already talked about, I'm still have this thing, I don't exist, right? That's in the background. I'm interested in Eastern religion. And so I think I'm a summer of sophomore year in high school. I think I was 16. Um, I started hanging around with these guys that were doing drugs. Now, some of these people in high school, I don't know how they do it. I mean, there would be guys, they were like tripping on LSD every other day. I have no idea how they pull that off. They, they, they must have some filters or something, 
or they'd be able to drive a car on the stuff. I, I, I don't know how they do that. I, but, I did that, but boy, it was powerful oh. stuff. I couldn't have done it every other day. <laughs> So I don't know if it's a tolerance or they just they're just blocked because you know to me something like that just opens you so wide. I mean your whole constructed world falls apart. Yeah, you know one one comment on that. Uh, a couple of months ago, I interviewed um, the guy who wrote How to Change Your Mind. Uh, what's his name? Michael Pollan and Chris Beish, uh all about LSD. And both of those guys, you know experimented with it or went about it in an extremely careful, dedicated way uh, and set up conditions such that they really went extremely inward with it, um, as opposed to people who might do it and then go to a party or a dance or something like that. So, you know, I think perhaps what you're alluding to is that when you did it, there was a deep sort of inwardness that would have precluded being able to drive a car, do normal things. Whereas these other guys, you know, perhaps they just weren't that inward and they were able to just sort of carry on in, in the relative world because of that. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there is, is something like that. And you're either wired one way or you're wired the other way. And again, you know, these folks that you're talking about, um, you know, they were intentionally going inward. So it, it can, like anything, anything has its, everything has its place. So it wasn't, uh, so it was the second trip. First trip was kind of nice and fun. The second trip was like, I went to a place that was like, whoa, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, it isn't just about the hallucinations you're seeing or the patterns in the wall or whatever. It was like, this is not something that I want to do again. It scared the living crap out of me. <laughs> and not literally, but I mean, it was like, whoa. And it took me, um, well, no, I got, did get, get down from that. So then it was like about a week later, I was, we were out in the park, it was at night, you know, this is August, it's summer, nice and warm. And so um, one of my friends, we, we smoked some weed together and we lay down on the grass looking up at the stars. And, you know, I didn't really feel that high, um, but I was. And so I'm looking up at the, the stars and all of a sudden, Again, I, I just, everything disappeared, you know, just like, I just was like this, like, like really going to sleep, you know, consciously going to sleep. And all of a sudden, when I started to come to a little bit, all, all I was was the stars, you know, I couldn't separate myself, I couldn't find my body, it was like, it was just like, it was almost like I was, you know, totally asleep, I was conscious as these stars, you know, everything was just enmeshed and merged. And, you know, I probably liked that for quite some time. And then all of a sudden something that, you know, the mind structure came back and says, what, 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 what's going on? You're, you're, this is not good. You're, you're totally losing yourself, you know? And I tried to get up, I, you know, as I felt my body, sense of my body coming back, I tried to get myself up, you know, to stand up. There was just the urge to stand up because I thought, well, th this will center me. And as I tried to push against the ground to stand up, it, it felt like the ground was like jelly. I, 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 there wasn't anything there, and you know, which made me panic. And I got up, started walking around. It was like, well, there's nothing behind me. It's just this moment, and and my whole world just like fractured. You know, my whole constructed world was like seen through. And I'm like going, I don't like this. <laughs> this is more than I bargained for. It's a lot different than, you know, looking in the mirror going, you don't exist for a moment. This was like, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. I don't know who I am. There's nothing here. And in that experience, you know, we, I went home and, and thought it would clear. And I, I just could never get my bearings again for the longest time. And um, longest time meaning days, weeks? Days. You know, so I, I couldn't get to sleep at night. Every time I went to sleep, I'd go into these lucid dreams and it was like, oh, and there was no one to talk to about it. You know, yeah. nowadays it's like, well, you go down the block and find your, your non-dual teacher or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're talking about what, 1970, you know, there, 
the only thing I had was Ram Das Be Here Now book. And I don't think I saw that until a little later. Do you so, think that if there had been someone to talk to about it, you could have just relaxed into it and not fought it and it would have been okay? You would have been able to sort of move through it? Uh, you know, there's this lady named Suzanne Siegel. She's not alive anymore, but she wrote a book called Collision with the Infinite. Right, I've heard and, that. And, um, you know, she was in terror for 10 years when she had an awakening because she was fighting it the whole time. And right. then finally, finally she relaxed and it was fine. But, you know, it's kind of mad. And I've heard that described also that people can have a genuine, you know, awakening to, you know, self-realization or cosmic consciousness or whatever. But um, without knowledge it can be a terrifying experience and they mm -hmm. can misinterpret it and struggle against it and just, you know, make a big mess of what could otherwise be a, a real blessing. Well, you, yeah, exactly. I mean, if someone had been there to, you know, that, that understood the territory and say, oh, this is going on, you know, they, they would know. I mean, I do this with people when they're freaking out. It's like, well, just come here, just come here, be the felt sense here. Don't let the mind, don't follow the mind reacting to it, trying to move away, making you crazy. Yeah, so, so yeah, so I couldn't get to sleep at night. And that went on three days, um, not being able to get to sleep. And then um, at some point I was, and I stayed in the house, you know, I, I wasn't seeing my friends. So I didn't, you know, I was like isolated. At least I could have gone to one of my drug friends and maybe talked about it. Let me just but, probe you again here. You, you couldn't get to sleep. And you mentioned that when you were trying to get to sleep, you would start having lucid dreams. Yeah. So again, it seems like maybe you could have gotten to sleep, except you were afraid to because it was a yeah. relinquishment of control or, or something or a surrender into something that you didn't know what it was. That's why you couldn't sleep, right? Well, yeah, it was fear, you know, as yeah, soon as fear. I would drop off, you know, fear, if, if, you know, the thing with fear is you're afraid of fear, it just escalates, you know. Um, yeah, you, that, that is exactly what was going on was the fear was keeping me up. I couldn't drop off to, you know, blow the lucid dreaming to just drop. So, so eventually, I think it was the third day of this, um, I called up one of my friends and I wanted to go over and, you know, just, just to get out of the house because I'm hiding from my parents. You know, my parents don't know I'm doing drugs. I'm being bad, right? And, and so I talked to him on the phone. I, I, he answers the phone, but then, you know, I was just after three days and no sleep and all this going on, not being able to get down, I hallucinated his voice and... It just, and then I, I, it felt like, you know, something, not that you can feel inside your brain, but something just, I could feel this, you know, like buzz through my brain. And like, I was almost like hit with a hammer and I just felt, oh my gosh, I am going crazy. I am going crazy. I am going to totally go nuts. And so I ran and told my mom what was going on, which then got me into the, um, eventually into the, um, um, psychiatric Psych place. Yeah. And they gave me, I don't know what they gave me. It was a nice drug. Maybe it was Ativan or something. I don't know what they had back then, but it calmed me down. Um, but I do remember, you know, they took me in the ambulance. Like, this is a big deal, right? And um, so they wheel me into the hallway. Your mom couldn't just drive you down? No, you know, because, you know, I was... I, I, I basically woke up. I finally did drop off to sleep that afternoon after I told her. And I think the doctor, we took me to the doctor. I think he gave me a little bit of a downer. So I was able to go to sleep. But then all of a sudden I came to and I couldn't, I, I knew who I was, but I couldn't, I couldn't find my mother or my body. And it's like, I, it was almost like I was in this tunnel trying to get out. And again, this fear is escalating. I remember grabbing onto her, trying to get, get back into this reality. And I think that just reeked her Reaked out. Her. And, <laughs> and so she called the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And so they put me on this stretcher, you know, <laughs> the ambulance. <laughs> dramatic. And yeah, it was dramatic. But what's she to do? She's this is, this is like new territory for her. She's heard all these scare stories about drugs. You know, and her son has done LSD and whatever. And so so we're in the the hospital, and I don't even think she came along in the ambulance. She just let me go. So they they had me on a stretcher in the um the the hallway, and I'm going. 
I mean, I'm freaking out. I'm losing my mind. You know, this is this paranoia is just going through and none of the staff is doing anything about me. They're just doing about their business. And I'm laying down on the table like, oh, I'm really losing. I'm really losing. Why aren't they coming to help me? And finally, after about like a half hour of this, I finally stood up. And they said, oh, you finally decided to stand up on the table. <laughs> it was like, I was looking around. It's like, they're not making a big deal about this. And I'm looking around, well, am I making a big deal on this? What's going on? <laughs> so anyway, they gave me a drug and I slept that night. And then I was on Valium for a while. And that was, but I kept having these, the same thing. I'm disappearing. You know, it was like, I, I felt like there was a black hole constantly chasing me even after I stabilized. And so there was this, again, the spiritual impulse, there was this curiosity, what is going on here? There was, I want to find out what this is. And then there'd be this other part, no, 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 don't go there, don't go there. (laughs) And so that was my life from then on until I was the age, what, 40, 45, I think, 2000, something like that. So so for like 25 years or something, you were kind of like on a seesaw between wanting to know what this was, but then afraid of it and mm-hmm. backing off. You were just sort of right. in this limbo state all those years. Yeah. So I would do like, um, I, you know, read more books. I did transcendental meditation. Um, you know, Bruce Randall, by the way, he was the guy that turned me on to transcendental meditation. And then ring a bell. come to mind. I, I might have met him. I was, I was a TM teacher for a long time and I was on the East coast mostly, but, um, I don't remember Bruce. Well, he would have been at the university there in Fairfield for a bit. I did visit him there one summer. There was a Dave he, Ramble here who died a few years ago, but uh, I don't remember Bruce. No, that's anyway. Bruce. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm just curious on that since you're in Fairfield, Iowa. I thought, I thought about Bruce. So, so anyway, I did Transcendental Meditation, and that was kind of nice. Um, it sort of settled me. But the problem I had with that was I'd get very spaced out with it. I would really get lost in the thought to where, you know, I was kind of sort of not really here in my body. You mean during the practice or During during the practice. During the practice. Hmm. Um, I I was sort of, you know, kind of During the practice, you're not supposed to be necessarily functional in activity because you're withdrawing the senses from their objects and going deep right. within. So that's not really a problem. It's, but you, some people get spacey even afterwards because they don't yeah. <clears throat> stabilize it or integrate it enough. Well, <clears throat> you know, I maybe think, they don't engage in a, a yeah. dynamic activity as much as they should. Yeah. Well, it, for me, it was like the, the meditation was I couldn't stay on the mantra. I just couldn't stay very focused. You're not supposed to. You're not but supposed anyway. to. Well, anyway, I learned that one later, actually. Back in that point, I to now. Yeah. <laughs> but back then, you know what I was told later when I went to a psychic awareness class, she says, you know, you're yeah. not, your body, you're spacing out too much. And so it yeah. was more active kind of meditation. But then later sure. I um, <laughs> was into um, self-realization fellowship. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I took Kriya Yoga. I did Kriya right. Yoga for many years. And, you know, hardcore meditator, you could say. But so there was that going on. But if, if you talk to my wife, she, she once we get on this conversation, there, there'd be times that be driving in the car one time. In fact, lots of times it, the motion in an airplane or driving a car would bring this black hole experience on. And she always talks about one time we were driving back from Eastern Oregon and I was just having a big time in the car. I couldn't find the car. I couldn't find my body. And I was like flailing around in the car looking for something to grab onto. And she's just saying, you know, I just, um, I just always felt like everything was going to disappear and explode. Like there's nothing really here. So, you know, I mean, I don't see that as pathological. I mean, something like that could be, but I have a feeling like you had one foot in the transcendent to the extent that, um, and it wasn't integrated well with your relative experience such that, you know, things could sort of shift you into that state. Um, and then you had trouble functioning in the relative. I mean, obviously eventually, and probably you're there now, you have to integrate it so that you can be, as deep and profound as anyone can be, and yet you can drive the car and pay your taxes and you know do all the concrete mundane stuff that needs to be done. So it's a matter of integration. 
Yeah. Well, that, that was the process. So, so that was my life until I, um, um, Dawn, my wife, um, dragged me to the Center of Sacred Science one day. She had been going there for a year, and my my part that didn't want anything to do this, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> I know where this is going to take me, right? And um, but yet, you know, the the curious part says, yeah, but why not? So anyway, actually, Joel Joel's a good guy. He was the first guy that said, oh, you know, you have fear. You know, <laughs> fear is just fear, right? He, so, so you're referring to Joel Morewood, Moore, who's, Joel Morewood again, who's yeah. been on Bath Gap. If people want to yeah. look that up, and there, there's a link to the Center for Sacred Science there on his page. Go ahead. Um, yeah, he he's 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 a very knowledgeable. You know, he he is. I remember that about him. In fact, I think when I interviewed sucks. him, he had a huge bookshelf behind him when I was yep. talking to him. He's like all this all this stuff. Yeah, his niche is seeing that all this stuff you can find that every mystical tradition or every religious tradition has this mystical element to it. So, um, what was beautiful about him was that when I would talk to the monks and self realization fellowship about this, that you know, they said, Well, you're supposed to feel bliss, you're supposed to feel joy. Well, you know, I do get some bliss and some joy, don't get me wrong, but it's like, you know, when really. Really, I start booking on meditation. It turns into this. You know, it's like there's nothing here, right? So anyway, it's interesting that those monks didn't have that understanding in their toolkit. You know, because it is pretty universal. I mean, there are probably hundreds of interviews that I've conducted in which that kind of topic comes up. You know, about the sort of the, the you know the the more difficult aspects of the path and the dark night of the soul and all that kind of yeah. thing. Well, to be maybe fair, they just hadn't gone through it themselves. Well, to be fair, um, there was only two I talked to, and the first guy he was he wasn't the high class monk, you know, and he was the one that says, "Oh, you you, you should you should go to some therapy or something. You got psychological problems." The second guy, Santo Shananda, who was really a very beautiful being, he he did he was helpful. He did get it. Um, I don't remember what he told me to do, if anything. Um, but then, you know, we were at the convocation down at self realization <laughs> Fellowship. So it was only like a day, you know, and there's a line to talk to these guys and everyone wants the, the super duper monks. And so, you know, you only get your five minutes and that's it. But anyway, so I, remember, I, I don't uh, want to say they don't. One time a friend of mine was going through a real spacey phase like that. And he asked Marushi what he should do. And Marushi said, go get a job loading trucks. <laughs> <laughs> That helps sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just something really gross and mundane and physical. <laughs> well, I remember I had one friend, you know, he knew one guy, and, you know, he, he totally, you know, had one of those, and all of a sudden his head disappeared and he spread out all over. And the, the advice was eat some meat. Yeah, Lots they say that too. Smoke cigars, <laughs> eat meat, whatever, something grounding. Yeah. So, Although I would suggest there are ways of doing it that don't pollute your nervous system. Not that meat necessarily pollutes it. I know plenty of beautiful people who eat meat, but um, you know there are ways of integrating and stabilizing. But there definitely is this thing about, and maybe this, maybe not everyone can relate to this. But if you're doing a lot of spiritual practice, a lot of meditation, it needs you need to be you need to get grounded, you know, and you need to alternate it with something grounding. I mean, I play pickleball seven hours a week, which is a very mm -hmm. intense physical sport. Um, not that I would be a space cadet if I didn't, but it it's just fe <laughs> it feels really right, you know, to have yeah. that intense activity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I do building construction or gardening or something like yeah, that. It's nice just to get your hands on something every once in a while if you're here. Yeah. Um, or walk. But so anyway, at the the center under you know Joe Morewood at the Center for Sacred Science. Um, He's very big on, you know, practice. And so this is, this, you know, before I was, other than the Buddhism books that I had read, it was, I was following more of a um, Hindu tradition, you know, Maharishis from India and, sure. you know, and Yogananda. Yogananda is, yeah. It's, um, the Buddhists have, you know, they're, they're a little more scientific about it. Um, and so... Yeah, you're shaking your head. <laughs> well, uh, Yogananda not... and Marshi both emphasized science a lot. Yeah, they, they did. They, they really thought that it was important for all this stuff to be scientifically verified, both of them. Right, they did, they did. 
Um, I, th- I think in terms of the practices, some, at least for me, um, there was a, a more of a concrete approach. I mean, I was doing, um, um, actually, I, I got this from uh, Pema Chodron, you know, her book, Start Where You Are. Um, the, basically, to me, the first 10 pages are the whole book on that thing, mm-hmm. for me anyway. <clears throat> So and is that the it, kind of practice that um, Joel was advocating, uh, more at of the Bo- time, Buddhist practice? Well, what? No. Well, Joel has just a basic breath meditation. You know, you just you wander, you come back to the sensation of the breath, you wander again. You're not. Yeah. You just that's your anchor, right? Kind you of just a come back there. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So what? What I sort of morphed that into was um, well, they, I think they call it shamatha, to where I would just uh, that out breath. I would f- just do anything. When the out breath came, I was the out breath. And so I would get, you know, these bouts of fear, you know, oh, the black hole is coming in. What's going to happen? And and so every time that happened, I would out breathe into it and just sort of sigh. Again, I'm integrating the body. I'm coming here, right? Rather than going into mental land, oh, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, once that thing, that will mind takes off. I mean, it can go places, right? I mean, it's a tricky little devil. And so I, uh oh, I, 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 black hole, I can't can't feel my body. Where's my body? Mind freak out. And then next out breath comes in. And it'll be like this sigh. And when I feel myself coming out of this mental thought land place. Wow. So each breath would be, there'd be a wave of it, huh? So just yeah. wave after wave after wave. That's right. interesting. And so I would start to feel, you know, at first it would be this intense fear in the body, right? And breathe out into that fear. But what I learned was that intense fear, which is the mind's worst enemy, it's like, I, I, you know, it's like a dog trying to run, right? I, I breathe out into that. And what I found, if I just was in that raw felt sense of that fear energy, it was like, it got me here. And there was like an okayness. It was like, it was like a relief. It was like, it's not so bad. I was like, there's nothing here, but that's an idea, right? I'm here. Something is here. This intense fear is here. And so I, um, I just did that. And again, the, the Center for Sacred Science, you know, always talking about, oh, you're going to get your Gnostic awakening if you keep at this, you know, this, this little carrot, you know. And in doing this practice, after a while, it's like, I didn't care about a Gnostic awakening. It was like, what? it was just, it was so rich just to sink into here. Probably, there was I mean, no. Sounds like the Gnostic awakening happened. Just the carrot got in I, your mouth. <laughs> you know, you're going to get this, and you know, everywhere, all the other fellow students are going, oh, yeah, we got it. No, 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 we got to get this, we got to get this. Did you have an awakening yet? Yeah. It's like, like you said, the Gnostic awakening was sort of like seeping through. It's like, no, it's okay just to be here. And so it just got to be so, so nice. It was just like, no, I'm just here. And it's not to say that the black hole fear wouldn't come up, but there was a way of going, oh, it's like a welcoming of it, so to speak, rather than a running. Do you have an explanation for what was causing this fear? Um, Maybe now in retrospect? Fear of annihilation. It's a a fear of losing my um, pseudo-constructed self. Seeing that it's a fake. It's just a it's just a mental construct. Yeah, I mean that's very scary. And basically it was the that construct freaking out. It wasn't the real me freaking out. Yeah. I'm glad you said that, because I don't think it would have been an intellectual fear of annihilation. It's more like a visceral fear mm-hmm. based upon the fact that the ego structure is actually starting to dissolve. Mm-hmm. And when it does that, there's a sort of gut reaction to resist the resist dissolution you know mm-hmm. because it wants to retain its identity and I've, I've seen this many times in in conversations with people but um it's kind of like this threshold that has to be crossed in which the ego just r- relaxes and dissolves and there's a fear that comes up as we approach that threshold much like there's a turbulence that arises if we're flying a jet close to the speed of sound and and you know it gets really turbulent as you cross the sound barrier and then it smooth yeah 
Yeah, there's that transition point, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's that point in between. That's the, the real rough place. Um, so, so that was going on, you know, this just sort of sinking and just, just being present and this okayness with uncomfortable sensation or uncomfortable energy, you could say. And um, so we went on a um, five-day retreat at the center that um, Joel and his, um, his firstborn, on, he, he used to call her his firstborn, the firstborn that um, he recognized as having the first Gnostic awakening under him. Um, she, um, they were co-teaching. And um, all I'm doing, I'm going there and, you know, the fear would come up, oh, I'm disappearing, I'm spreading out. Um, still doing the same sort of practice. Okay, breathe out. I'm here. And there was one night on the retreat, I think the fourth day, where all of a sudden, you know, I just felt so connected to everything. Everything was, it was like I was in this zone. You know, anything I touched or did was like doing itself, so to speak. And so, um, I'm going, wow, wow, I can't believe this. I can't believe this, right? I mean, the the structure had been so closed down and it's like opening. It's like, what is going on? This is incredible. I mean, <laughs> and so I went to Joel that night and I, I told him, I said, Well, Joel, I I think I'm I think I'm waking up. I think I'm getting enlightened, is what I think I said. <laughs> and he just yells at me. Who's getting enlightened? Who's getting enlightened? Because nobody gets it. It gets itself, right? It's that old thing, right? And, you know, he's just like harping on me. He says, I want you to go to the last night of the retreat, right? So the next day, it's, um, maybe it was the fifth day. I can't remember. It was the last night of the retreat. So the next morning, we're leaving, right? And so, so he says, you, 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 you go back to your room or go back in the meditation hall and don't you give up until you see that you're enlightened, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully if you're eating dinner with Joel and you say, please pass the salt, he doesn't say, who wants the salt? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he just give you the salt. <laughs> Sometime I was co-teaching with him and <laughs> I'm leading them on, you know, well, you know, it's all sensation, you know, if you don't follow the subject object thing, you know, and you're in the diner, like you hear the coffee part going, you know, it's just, it's just sound. It's just sound, right? And I'm, I'm leading him on this. And then Joel has to correct me. He says, well, you know, it also means that the coffee's ready. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> which is true. We interpret know? the sound. Right. Right. So it's both. It's both. Without you which we still, couldn't function. Yeah. You can still have the thought of it, but you can also see that, you know, the thought is just another arising. And. So anyway, so we go, um, what happened then? Um, so you, he sent you to the room. He said, you know, go, go yeah. there and, yeah. you know. And so all night long, all of a sudden, I've lost this beautiful in the zone state. You know, I'm like sitting there trying to get it back and I can't get it back and I can't get it back. And I just, oh, <laughs> what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know, my time is almost up. And so. I think it was that night, I mean, it's like four in the morning and I'm just lying there in my bed awake and I'm just in this very peaceful place. I'm listening to the sounds of the birds as they're chirping in the morning and I'm just like, there's no thought. I'm just, you know, I can just feel myself as the bird, but you know, it's just, just wonderful, right? It's like, oh, something's going on, something's going on. Stay with it, Tom, stay with it. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, the mind comes back in and think some dumb thought. And one of the things I've been doing all along in the outbreath, when the mind would come back in and think, I would sort of give it compassion. It was like, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. There, there wouldn't be, I was getting rid of this beat up syndrome that we all have. You know, it's like, what's the matter with you? You're a bad meditator. You know, you should have, right? And so there's this welcoming of that. And, and that, you know, sometimes that repetitive practice, you think, oh, well, it's, well, why should I just say you too? What, what's the point of that? Something builds behind the scenes. And so I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the mind comes in, just very peaceful, open place. And the mind comes back in, which it always does. What are you going to do about it? 
And, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the little boy says, what's the matter with you? You are almost there. You, you should have had it, man. But then the, oh, you're okay too came in. And this again, is like a mystery. You can't, when this, when it opens like this, you can't, it's like the mind doesn't get this. The mind, you can set the table per se, but you can't, you can't make it happen. Something all of a sudden, this aha, very, very deep felt you know, don't even know where it was, said, saw that the thought of the mind was exactly the same as the sound of the birds. There was absolutely no difference. The whole thing was equal. Yeah. And we can Just talk another about another sensory experience. Right. How, we can talk about that intellectually, but when it's grokked, the way it was grokked, it was like all of a sudden everything spread out because, well, well, we're, I, I have these special thoughts, right? <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. They're like a bird all over the place, you know? And, and so it was like something really fractured at that point, something so fractured. And um, so, um, and then of course at the morning breakfast, Joel was saying, hey, you know, you haven't seen it yet. You better get busy and go for it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like he's a bit of a taskmaster. Uh, oh, he he's a teddy bear mostly, but you know, he ever told me later, he says, I sorry it was so harsh on you, you know, but he needed to be. It was it was part of the game, really. Yeah. Um, and I could see it, you know, it was part of the play. I always it didn't really feel that harsh to me. It was sort of like it was sort of like a you know, when teachers do that and they're doing that in a compassionate way, not in a vindictive way. It, it was breaking something down in the mind. You know, the mind says, I got to do it. I got to do it. And it's like breaking that down. I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah. It's kind of like, like a football thing. coach saying, come on, you guys. Yeah. yeah. Keep pushing. You gotta, right. you need, sometimes you need a little bit of a mm -hmm. coach like that. There's a few thoughts that what you've been saying have come brought to mind. Um, one is that I think that what you were undergoing was not just a mental or psychological transformation it's a physiological transformation and Absolutely. you know both the gross and the subtle physiology have to undergo this shift to a new style of functioning in order for the consciousness or the awareness to be in a new style of functioning and um and that doesn't happen on a dime you know they, they talk about neuroplasticity the brain's ability to change its structure and function but you know that doesn't happen in an instant it, it takes time for the neurons and whatnot to reconfigure themselves so you know, it's good to know that because if a person feels that it should happen instantly um, it's a misunderstanding and and they're just going to have to sort of let nature run its course to a certain extent yeah well that's what i always tell people it's it's don't push the river it, there's a wisdom to the unraveling, you know, you, you let it do your unraveling because you're right. It's, it's, everything is getting rewired on every single level and that takes time. You know, it, that's when people will burn their circuits out if they just push and push and push. It's like, I had that too. There was times when something would really open you know, prior to this meditation retreat, uh, one time it was just sort of like, again, I felt this black hole like I couldn't get out of it. And again, I was the curious versus no. And finally, the movement was, okay, go downstairs, go on the internet and distract yourself. <laughs> and back then, internet was really slow. We're talking about 1999, where you have dial up, you know, yeah, of course, the uh, website's not as complicated. But that was, it was <laughs> like, and it took a whole half hour until I could get back, you know, to, to my normal sense. Yeah. And, and so sometimes distracting yourself is really important. It's like, don't push it, take a break. Um, you know, when you need a break, honor it. No, don't be yeah. a martyr here. And sometimes you read about these stories, you know, of these yogis who were so extreme, they would sit in the snow all night, you know, and cut off their arm in order to impress the Zen master that they were serious and all this stuff. And I think it can instill a certain amount of overzealousness <laughs> in seekers. I mean, on the other hand, don't be lackadaisical and lazy about it. it you know, there's a certain, but there's a certain balance to be found. And that balance is going to be different for different people. Yeah. There's a verse in the Gita, which reads, uh, 
because because one can perform it, one's own dharma, though lesser in merit, is better than the dharma of another. So you know we can't all be the the Superman yogi who does this intense routine and you know twenty four hours a day and never sleeps and you know does nothing but meditate. I mean the average person tries that and like you said he's going to fry his circuits, right? And, and he's going to set himself back and not progress. Well, the other thing to keep in mind, everybody's path to knowing who they are is slightly different. And just exactly. like every every human delusion is slightly different. So one size never fits all. Yeah. And, and so to compare yourself to like a Ramana Maharshi, for instance, I mean, what happened with him? He, you know, he writes he was 15 years old and he has this death, you know, experience exploring what happens if I die. And all of a sudden he is just like, Everything is go to the mountain and just sit and let rats crawl gnaw on my leg, <laughs> and it, it's like there he came. It's sort of like Mozart. You know, Mozart was at yeah, five years old. Five year old prodigy. Some, they came in symphonies. with something, so their wiring where they were at is very different. So we all think, yeah, I'm going to have this little awakening, and then I'll be like Ramana Maharshi. No, good luck with that. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good advice, you know, and one phrase you just said, don't compare yourself with others. Yeah. I think that's very important. You can drive yourself crazy comparing yourself with others. Um, you know, do what's right for you. We each have a dharma, we each have a, a course of action that is most <clears throat> conducive to our evolution. And we do best to follow that. And that, that can mean raising a family or, you know, having a job or what, whatever circumstances seem most conducive to the life we're living. Yeah. Okay, so the account, you, you, I think you just about wrapped up the account you were telling us. You were there on the retreat, you had stayed up all night, you're down at breakfast, and Joel Moorhead is still yelling at you, but... He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's got a good bad rap, isn't he? I know, no, he's a great guy. Um, <laughs> we're just teasing him a bit here. But um, it sounds like you, that was your watershed moment there. Well, actually... More or less. Actually, it, it went on. It was like we left a retreat, and uh, you know, to me, one one of the war. There's lots of watershed moments, but really, the the most, you know, the the biggest one. Let's say, um, you know, what what Joel we referred to as a Gnostic awakening, and after that, to me, it went on. You know, I went to another teacher, um, David Waldman, but but that that night, coming back from the retreat. You know, I went to sleep that night, and um, in the morning, it must have been like four again, you know, always early in the morning. Um, there's this thing, again, we talked about the transition between the, you know, knowing you're the structure, the structure of my world comes back versus I'm this vastness. That place where I just wake up, when we just wake up, you know, that's a transition. And that would always be like a very, very difficult thing for me because all of a sudden you're you're just you're just the primal soup. You know, there's no no way looking. It's you know you just it. There's no one there, right? But that's what it what it is right now, right? So when the world comes back in to feel that coming back in and touching this human experience, it's like I mean it's 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 a shock. It's a shock. And that used to generate fear during this time. <gasps> you know, and, oh, where, where's my world? Where's my body? Where's this? Where's this? You know, this whole thing going on, right? So this time when I woke up, it was like rather than the, the fear came in, but then the response was, I'm so tired of this. I just relaxed. You know, tired can be very, exhaustion can be very um, um, useful. So there's just this exhaustion. It's like, I can't keep doing this. And it wasn't so much a story. It was more like a visceral feeling. Oh. And so I got up to, um, got up and thought, well, what should I do now? I'm, uh, maybe I should meditate. And the thought was, no, nah, I'm so tired of meditating. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'll just make myself a cup of tea. And just like, just... Just everything is just sort of flowing and there isn't this looking for anything. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's not like I don't care, but I don't, but it just, everything's just, ah, uh, okay. Here I am, right? 
and I'm making the cup of tea. And I, again, one of those, just like the bird thing with the, the thoughts, you know, something, all of a sudden I, I was at the counter making the tea and I looked up across the room and I think I blanked out for a moment, you know, just something just blanked. And when I looked again, I mean, I was looking, you know, as a, as a child, I, I knew myself as the room. I knew myself as the cloud and all. That's when it came back. Says, that's what that kid was looking at. Everything was myself everything was myself not my ego self but you know the ego self was just a reflection off it was just part of it but i just looked around it was like wow i was looking at this the whole time it was like a recognition of what was always there it wasn't some bells and whistle things although it had bell and whistle quality it was so ordinary it was so ordinary that it was extraordinary and all of a sudden i was just like Every little thing was so connected. Um, and, you know, then later that morning, I'm just, I, I think I told Dawn, you know, what had happened. And we had to take, um, our daughter had to go to the doctor. So I took her to the doctor, you know, here just at this blasted opening, right? And so what, what in the life, rather than, you know, going and sitting, it's like, no, we're going to the doctor. We're taking our 16-year-old to the doctor. And I'm sitting in the waiting room while she's seeing the physician. And this little kid, they had, she had these shoes on that when you move, they, they flash lights. Uh, yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd never seen those before. <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was some kind of hallucination or something? I'm going, what? <laughs> no, no, it can't be. <laughs> Finally, I, mine puts it together. No, that there's got to be a little flashing lights going on. So... You know, that that was you know um, that was you know really knowing the space and you know opening the head center and opening the heart to a certain extent opening the belly to a certain extent but you know it just went on after that I can go more into what happened later no, I'd like um, you to actually um because I'm glad you said to a certain extent because a lot of people conceive of awakening as being some end point, you know, after which there's no more development. And even some people who had an awakening think that it's finished. And eventually, I think most of them discover that it isn't. But I'm, I'm quite interested in sort of post-awakening types of development. Um, yeah. I think that needs to be better understood. So let's keep talking about that. In your yeah. Case. Okay, good. I'm glad we're going there. Um, because to me, that's, that's more important. I, I think there's two types, you know, there's a type like in my experience, at some point, there was a definite demarcation. It was like, oh, that's it, right? And I think there's also people, again, everyone does this differently. There's also the oozers. Yeah. You know, they kind of yeah. ooze into it. Mm -hmm. And you can't find one sharp point. And usually the storyline is, oh, it's this sharp thing. One minute I don't know, and then I do. Yeah. But, and even if but, it is a relatively sharp thing, as it somewhat was in your case, it still keeps going. You know? It keeps going, yeah. Because, again, as I described before, there's a, a spacious element to it. Like I said, the head center open. There, there's, I couldn't believe a thought anymore. Even when I was believing a thought, it was like, I, 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 it just, that, that part was just done. It's like, yeah, sure, I can entertain them. But sooner or later, they just pop. It's like, yeah, right. Right? So, but there's the belly center, which is... So hang know, on just one second visceral. before you get into that. Yeah. So when you say you couldn't believe a thought anymore, does that mean you didn't have opinions or you didn't have like a particular political candidate you'd want to vote for over and Oh, yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah, what, is that? what do you mean by that? that? I still get that. But, but it's like I have my opinions, I have my preferences, and, and I can follow them and sometimes get kind of heated about them, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> um, but they're not as sort of solid or compelling well, or something? Because, because when I say I can see through thought, it's, it's like when you have the experience, it's like, well, the thought is no different than a bird. How can you, how can you take it too seriously? It's, it's like it becomes a game. And sometimes in the moment, the thought is right on in the reality of the moment. It has relevance, but then it no longer, you know, it was relevant for that moment. Otherwise, it's just conditioning that we play. But I still entertain them. Sure. 
I'm a, I'm a Democrat, you know? Yeah. I think you are too. Uh, but very much sometimes so, yeah. I listen to the confusion out there and I go, well, I don't know, maybe, well, I'm not right. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm right, but who knows for sure? You know, there's lots of different ways of viewing all this stuff, but I, I like to help people. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, it's like people tend to want to think in black and white terms. Like, and these people are completely wrong and our people are completely right. Or, you know, my, re my religion is the only way and everybody else, everybody else is going to hell and all this stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, I like to sort of think, oh, like, let's look at it from God's perspective. And since everything is God, all these perspectives must be God's perspective. And obviously there's a great diversity of them. Uh, they're just different sort of, you know, different blind men feeling the elephant. Um, which is not to say that there aren't certain things we'll value over other things, but everything, all is well and wisely put. It, it, it's just kind of a, be an ocean, you know, and contain everything rather than just being, well, you actually, you, you have a little quote here from Rumi that I've picked up off your website. Good point to read it. You said, we are not drops in the ocean. Each of us is the entire ocean in a drop. In other words, we are the beloved being personal, not a separate one who has a personality. We are so interconnected in this beauty as it expresses itself personally inside its vastness. One moment so very big and another moment so close and intimate. Um, there's a Sanskrit saying which goes, um, Ano Raniyan Mahato Mahiyan, which means smaller than the smallest, bigger than the biggest. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, take yeah. it from there. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> that's so sweet. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what I mean. It, it's like, yeah, I can have thoughts, but the thoughts don't have me. Sometimes they have me. That still goes on. That's part of God too, right? I mean, it's like anything goes, basically, is what you see. You, you can't take a... You, I become positionless even when I'm taking a position. So, so anyway, so to get back with, you know, one of the things that I see again is we have this... We could have a very sharp, pronounced awakening, so to speak, but if you're, if you really, and maybe like your Ramana Maharshi, and even then, you know, it went on for him. It's not to say it didn't. Oh, it right? did. Sure. He sat yeah, in that for, cave for um, right. 20 years. Or even just... Yogananda, you, you read about, I, I love to read, I got a biography book on him written by a journalist and you find out, oh my God, he was fretting about money all the time. Yeah, Phil, Phil Goldberg. Yeah. 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 He and, just um, wrote that recently. Right. And, uh, you know, you find him, he was going through bouts of sadness and like, I mean, he was ostracized so much. But anyway, so you, you, we, we emulate these people. We tell stories about them and says, oh, they're so perfect. There's nothing wrong that he does. You know, one, one time, one hidden story was the, at the lake shrine, his, um, his um, houseboat was starting to sink. And no one tells this officially, but he was like freaking out. He was yelling, get out there, get out there, get that boat. Good thing he did, right? But he's like freaking, you know. <laughs> he's not some calm, actively calm guy right now. He is like, get that boat, don't let it sink. So, so it's, it's good to see. It's, it doesn't look a certain way. And we make these stories and we emulate these people, but they're just imperfect human beings like everybody else. So part of the beauty of being human, yeah, either perfect or imperfect. So to get on with the, the um, ongoing, um, where we were going, so there's this post-awakening opening, you could say, let's call it that. And um, I can recall that the fear I talked about, it, you know, it would still crop up. And the, the teaching was... You know, the center teaching was, well, it's just phenomena arising in consciousness. There's nothing you need to do about it, right? Which, if you really, but I was curious about it. I wasn't going to get lackadaisical about that. So I ran across um, another teacher, um, David Waldman, also known as David G. I think he calls himself David G. right now, mostly. And, you know, he is working mostly with the heart. You know, you just go and you sit there with him and you do nothing, basically, but sit. Um, no real hardcore practice. You just sit. Um, 
does you he know, talk he, or, or yeah, yeah, he sits? talks. Yeah, no, yeah. we just sit. We don't do anything else. But <laughs> <laughs> no, he he is a you know devotee of Ramana Maharshi. You know that's, that's his supposed lineage. And so you know, very beautiful being, and again, imperfect human being too, as we all are. Um, and so anyway, we. Um, I started going there and he said, well, you know what? Your eyes are really, really clear. And he says, but there's, there's a piece that you're missing. And so I went on one retreat and the fear was coming up. The fear would come up around him sitting like that again. And again, the beauty now is like, it's like that, that, that awakening is sort of like that's what's climbing to the top of the mountain. And so you hit this plateau and it's like maybe three months of honeymoon. And then all of a sudden, well, now more stuff is moving through, but you're on the downhill slope. You know, you don't believe you're a doer anymore. It's sort of like you're coasting. It's so hard, but it's not like it was. You're not seeking, you know, you're there, so to speak. It's all okay. But it's sort of like nature is doing the work for you. Right, right. Which it was in the beginning too, but now you know it is. Now you, now you experience that. Yeah. yeah. You're being baked, right? And so <laughs> let yourself be baked. And so... And actually, it can accelerate at that point, you know, because, the, because an ocean can dissolve clumps of mud a lot better than a, a, you know, a little glass of water. Yeah. Right, right. So, so you're, sorry, you're on easy street. You may go through some intensity... So D- David always talked about purging, which I never heard from the center. You know, you're in a purge, your know, body would heat up, something would be releasing. And um, so anyway, I, I go on this retreat with him and, you know, he has me come up to the chair because we do dialogue in the chair. And he says, well, just connect with me. So, you know, I connected with him. I started like weeping and sobbing. And, and all of a sudden, again, you know, everything sort of, open up and disappear. I couldn't, you know, just a whole different level of being here and feeling everything. And um, I jumped up, I wanted to run, you know, he grabbed me and said, no, no, stay here, stay here. Very good advice, stay here. Next morning, you know, we used to hardcore, he would um, get up like we'd, we'd be sitting like 5.30, 6 in the morning before the official sit would happen. So I went there and he's sitting there. And the story was all of a sudden I saw on the story level, it's like, wow, you know, this guy cares so much for me. He's willing to come up there and sit with me. Other people were sitting too. It wasn't just me. At this early in the morning, you know, that was the story. But what was really felt was the beloved one I am is willing to take all of me, to give it all to me. And I just, I started weeping, you know, just from the belly, just weeping. These tears that felt like bliss and just like, what a relief, what a relief. And later it was pointed out to me, you know, there's a lot of pain there too. And I go, oh my gosh, there's a lot of pain, but it feels kind of good. <laughs> and all that for the rest of that retreat, it was like I was being a reliving very early child infant trauma. Um, And that went on, you know, for like six months a year, I'd sit with him and immediately I would just double up and then it'd be like tears would be coming in my eyes, the snot would be coming out of my nose. I didn't care when it was coming out of my nose. Um, And it was like very pre-verbal stuff. I can't describe it, but the outcome is more and more to feel like when I was with grandma and feeling her pain in my body to see that the touching is, there's such a depth to the touching. There's really literally no separation and that's ongoing. I, I still feel like I'm walking around the dark, but um, um, anyway, that's to me was the opening of the belly That's interesting. I'll have some more questions about that, but here's a question that came in since we're speaking about pain. I think this might be be a relevant time to ask it. Francis O'Hara from Ellington, Connecticut asks, um, please speak about your experience with prayer. Not, okay, I'll keep reading here. And how to help a loved one who has died. Our brother chose suicide a few, um, I'm not sure whether it's years or, or what, ago. How might we help our Billy? Okay, Billy 
as the one that committed suicide. I yeah. Take it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, hold him in your heart. Okay, so there's the pain of feeling his the loss of him. And when you, you know, the, the thing about it is those that have passed on that are no longer in a physical body, the minute you think of them, you can feel their essence. You can feel them. And when you're feeling them, you're holding them. In fact, the more you just not so much feel the story about what he did or his life, but just feel who he is, the, the basis of who he is. Because you can look around and everybody has a different feeling of presence. So Billy has a presence. And so every time you bring him into your mind, you can say a prayer and say, you know, what, if, whatever you believe, God help Billy. But when you say that, feel his essence in your heart. That's the best thing you can do for him. And in that, you'll feel your own pain. And so you're holding for your pain and his essence and his pain. And you start to see that there's a larger holding for both of you, that it's all just part of you. That's what I can say with that one. That's nice. And the way you're phrasing it implies that Billy still exists in some way, shape, or form, which I think most of the people listening to this show would agree with. And even, even you know, surveys show most of the people in society agree that, you know, nobody dies. We just sort of transition in one way or another, however we want to believe that it happens. Uh, but Billy's still around in, on some level. And, uh, you know, by holding him in your heart, as you're saying, you're directly connecting with him in a real way that's um, beneficial. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I do that, you know, with my father who died in 91, very suddenly of a bee sting on the golf course, no less. Wow, allergic reaction. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, the minute I bring him in the mind, I feel him, I feel his essence. You know, he's there. This goes on. You know, why would the show end? It goes on. The universe would be pretty meaningless if it didn't. Life would be pretty meaningless. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you and I are talking about continuing evolution after awakening. Well, most people don't even get to awakening, but obviously there's, a, to my way of thinking, there's a purpose to the universe and there's a purpose to our lives. It's not just, uh, they're not just meaningless, random events. Um, and the, you know, the purpose is ultimately what we would call evolution, which we've been talking about during this show. And I talked about one way or another for 510 episodes, but it, it's a growth process towards something. We can continue to talk about what that something is. And, you know, we never reach the ultimate possibility in one lifetime. Maybe a tiny fraction of people do, but even then I, I, I have doubts. So the, the journey continues, you know. You wear out your clothes, you put on a fresh pair. Your car breaks down, you get a new car. Same with bodies and lives. Yeah, I think so. Can't prove it, but it goes on. You know it goes on because what we are is an eternal expression of the one. The one. We're like windows in the one. Yeah. And even not only the eternal dimension goes on, which by definition it would, but the relative expression that you know makes us up makes us tom or rick or whatever goes on and um maybe next time we won't be tom we'll be tomasito or you know <laughs> or <laughs> some different a whole different gender in life and everything else but the essence of what yeah. we are continues to grow right. right at least that's the way i see it and there's a fair um, i mean i was d discussing this with somebody not too long ago and he was very much doubting it but there's a lot of research there was a guy named I think Ian Stevenson or something at the University of Virginia that studied thousands of kids that had clear past life memories that were verifiable if you go in, in to the town that they described uh, they, they'd lived in or to the World War II plane that they'd crashed in or whatever. They had all this detail they could provide. Um, so there's a fair amount of evidence. And then there's Michael Newton with his Life Between Life, you know, hypnosis regression studies. And he's written a couple of books on that. And people go back and experience in great deal of detail and also agreement between the thousands of people he, he regressed uh, as to exactly what happens in that realm. So, you know, we can brush it off as 
bogus or hocus pocus if we want to stick to our materialist worldview, but it, but there's a lot of evidence there if we want to look into it. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, even now, you know, in this, what we look like as material world, this physical reality, what you start to see, it's so alive and interconnected. And so if this reality is that way, it, we, we construct it and we say, well, no, this is solid. When I leave there, you know, there won't be anything. But really, in a very real sense, this is just a slowed down dream. Yeah. Can you remember a time in your life when the world looked dead and lifeless and, and just visually, you know, it, it, it looked like dead. And now it looks, by contrast, extremely alive and, and full of intelligence. Oh, you're asking me to go back 20 years. <laughs> it's kind of, the, the funny thing about it is um, you forget how it was. Um, but, but I can remember that. I, I can even now, as I ask you, I can visualize, you know, back 50 years ago when I was a teenager and looking out at the woods on a rainy day and it all just looks so bleak and lifeless and dead. I never see things that, that way now. You know, there, there's always, it's always like almost full of bliss. Yeah, I think the problem with it for me is that when I look back, what what I see when I look back in any experience, even if it felt bleak and dead, is I feel the life that is beneath the bleak and dead. So it, my memory is colored, you know. Yeah, you're kind of enhancing it retrospectively. <laughs> it's like it goes, oh, it was there. What I'm seeing now, this aliveness that's there now, when I, the memory goes back, it's there then too and and it's like that memory really gets integrated in a way that's kind of strange as now because there's only now even the memory is a now um so i think it, it transforms so i'm trying i'm searching here to see if there was something that really felt bleak or dead i think i might be bored at times but there there's always this aliveness there uh, well, that's Maybe. good I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people might be able to relate to this because think how many people are on antidepressants, you know, uh, in this country, and um, they, the world doesn't seem like a very blissful place to them. Um, and maybe that's the reason I, I'm always kind of thinking of people who might be listening and what they might be experiencing, and hoping to sort of suggest that if it doesn't seem as rosy as you and I are describing it. Uh, there's hope. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. There's hope. It's funny, I just talked to someone this morning who has struggles with the depression. And um, it's so hard. It's And she's done a lot of work with this. And, um, you know, depression for me, and I, you know, have depressed feelings sometimes, but I always, what I do, it's like I can't entertain a story about how bad it is anymore. It's just sort of like a sinking kind of downer kind of feel. And if you can, and it's the last thing we usually want to do is to, to be that felt sense of the depression without the story, to, that, that yucky feeling to let that be my anchor out of the mind you start to see that something bigger is holding that. The aliveness is holding this yucky feeling. It's, it's like letting go of who you think you are and your problem. But it's rough stuff. It's rough stuff. Don't get me wrong. It's not an easy thing to deal with. Um, I remember one time working with a person in a retreat, and she has a chronic... Um, chronic... Um, condition a chronic disease that she's never going to recover from and so it's she still functions but it's it's going to get worse at times and it's frustrating for her and so she was she she comes and she's talking to me in the chair and i go she goes oh, i i don't know need to do with this i can't stand this and i said I, I started out well you know the thing is to let it be what it is to accept it right and and all of a sudden, I, I feel like, you know, something's not clicking right. <laughs> I feel a little turbulence over there with her. And so I go, all of a sudden, I went, oh, my gosh, who am I to say that you should just accept this? I don't have this disease that you know, was Parkinson's. I don't have this. Right. I feel and you do. Yeah. And I said, I bet you that pisses you off and you want to slug me in the face. And she says, Yeah. And I said, 
you need to embrace that anger over the Parkinson's. You're ripped off. I said, go there. And that that really did something for her because she never felt permission to be mad about her condition because she was supposed to be a good little spiritual person and uh, accept it as is. You get it? Yeah. It's like, no, you have to start where you are. And so that just opened up. That was creating such difficulty in her life that she wouldn't allow that anger to come in so she could be with it. That's so, good. good insight. You know, um, Adya talks about awakening happening sequentially, sometimes with head, heart, gut. And you've talked about head and heart. Have you had a gut thing that you could distinguish between the head and the heart awakenings? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we, we haven't talked about that yet. Well, I kind of led into it a little bit where I said like I was, you know, weeping and crying and it felt this pain in my belly. Uh, uh. Um, it's, it's, to me, the, the gut, it's like this, you know, we have in the gut, we have this, that's where our survival instinct is. I mean, if we didn't have any survival instinct, we couldn't function. You need that, but it wants to survive, wants to survive. And so you, you have to meet it, and it's scared. It's like a frightened little creature. And for me, most of that is, is pre-verbal. The only thing I can do with that when it comes on is I, I'm just that raw felt sense, and it's the pain is coursing through the body or the fear is coursing, or usually I'm just like crying. I haven't had a bout like that for a while. And... Um, and what the byproduct is, is that you feel more connected to what is rather than it feels like it's empty. You feel this really, really the aliveness has a substantiality to it. It's, it's like a touching. It's, it's a, you know, at the, not just a physical level, it's a real, real touching past the physical. The physical is a poor reflection of it. And that's belly energy. That's like being the creature, being here, the being everything on a visceral, real level. And um, belly energy always goes back to early childhood, you know, where something shut down. It's, it's like, eventually it's like being a baby coming out of the womb and you're coming out into this, you're just pure being, you don't have a lot of thought, you know, you're just, you're just the whole thing with no differentiation, no idea of a self that has differentiation. You're the fluidity of the moment. To me, that's belly energy. But to describe verbally what that is, um, <laughs> it usually goes pre-verbal. It's just, uh, <laughs> 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 do you um you know some sometimes people talk about having lost a sense of personal self as a result of their awakening or some stage of their awakening um and i always scratch my head a bit because i can sort of grok the notion of you know the impersonal being one significant or even primary or fundamental dimension of our experience but it seems to me that if we're alive there also still has to be a, the personal expression um and you know different we, we each have our own personal expression with which we identify to some extent i mean if, if i were there and i say you know tom would may i whack your thumb with this hammer or would you prefer <laughs> that i hit the stone over here you say go for the stone you know i mean <laughs> there's some kind of personal identification with with the tom guy that doesn't want his thumb whacked right so, the uh, belly what is energy your <laughs> to that <laughs> i mean have you ever sort of been utterly without a sense of personal self or do you feel like it's always been there to some extent even though the proportions have shifted between personal and impersonal yeah, it's a, that's a, those are very good subjects. Um, well, there's different levels of personal self. There's the personality, your structure. It's like I know what a fork is. You know, I'm a yeah, man. You know where to put it. Um, right, right. <laughs> it's not. It's good to still have access to that stuff. You know, that's like nothing wrong with that, right? But what there's so. What I see it, it's like the, the personal self, the idea of a me on a personality level, it's like a rainbow. You know, when you see a rainbow, oh, it's there, but yet it's not there. It comes and it goes. But to me, there's a deeper personal self 
that, um, well, Almas would call it the personal essence, where it's, it's the vastness, and I touched this on before, the vastness being personal versus the personality being personal, the separate one being personal versus the vastness now touches itself as a human being. It's being personal. And that's when I use the word essence. Everyone, you can feel that. If you get below all the stories about someone, you feel their essence. You can feel that as the vastness being a flavor of a personal. And that, that comes and goes too. Sometimes you're just the vastness. I mean, the you know, personal essence comes and goes like everything else. But you know, they, I think another word for that would be the soul. It's, but if you're it's nothing like, but the vastness, then is there any functionality at that point? Or are you talking about just a sort of an inward transcendent experience where there's just vastness and no sense of person? Well, if you're totally inward, uh, there, there's no functionality going on, right? I know, yeah. yeah just be, <laughs> like you, yeah. you hear the stories of the yogi. There's a story of a yogi that was, well, all kinds of stories of yogis right. being so absorbed in samadhi that you know people can do all kinds of things to them and they're not even aware of it. Right. But then, again, it, it all depends on what your situation is in life. If there's someone exactly, to take yeah. care of you, feed you or whatever, or you, you disappear. Um, but even then, I mean, last year's the Yogananda's life, he would go into that vastness and they'd have to have, on a cold night, they'd have to put mittens on his hand. I don't know why they needed mittens down in L.A., but there's a story. <laughs> and of, it must have been like down to 35 or 40. There. Know, <laughs> so, compared to India, that's cool. Compared, talking about that because one of the other guys was laughing at it and, and Yogananda all of a sudden comes to he, he's like totally out right and they gotta put mittens on his hands and all of a sudden it was um, Ananda Moy I think it was his name one of the beautiful monks and he, he he's, he's laughing at it because here's this grown man and the women the nuns have to put mittens on him and Yogananda all of a sudden comes to and all of a sudden he's functional he says yeah I used to laugh at the yogis when someone had to do that in India. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he goes back in. So you see, he came out, he got functional again. It's just, a, it's like we're going up and down an elevator, you know, being is so yeah. amazing. Well, you used the word rainbow not long ago. And it, I, I sort of think of it as a spectrum of, or you can think of the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, all these different frequencies um, with visible light and x-rays and, you know, radio waves and all this different stuff. It's the same field, but they're just different frequencies of it. So you could sort of think of life as progressing or, or as spanning a, a wide range of frequencies from un, totally unmanifest, impersonal, uh, you know, absolute, universal to much more specific expression and all kinds of gradations in between. Yeah. You know, what I always find interesting is you, you watch through the life and you get actively involved in something. The idea of a personal doing something can completely fall away to what it becomes like I call pure occurrence. Like reading a book, you get totally swept up in the book. There's something that's aware of the reading, but your sense of a personal one that's reading a book is totally gone. Yeah, and then all of a sudden you come to the end of the chapter, and the the personal personality ego comes in. Hey, that was a really good chapter, and it it, it pretends like well, I was there all along reading that. But if you look, no, you were gone. <laughs> you were a rainbow, and you left, right? Well, you hear great athletes describe being in the zone, you yeah, know, the zone, and, and they're just playing basketball or whatever in such a sort of a spontaneous, automatic way that there's not a lot of thought or choice happening. They just they they yeah. just a spontaneous flow. Yeah, well, that's that's sort of what it it gets to me. What what evolves? It's it gets to be more and more like that. But yet, even then, there is a personal essence that that is flavoring that movement for that form. I mean, you go to different masters or whatever, and they all got different flavors. But everything you start to see, it's all doing itself. There isn't really a doer, but sometimes a doer arises. Sometimes it's necessary to have a doer. What's your take on the? on the idea of free will. There's been all these debates about it, you know? <laughs> oh, my. My, that's a good one. Not that we're going to um, resolve it right now. It's been I don't think we're going to resolve going on it. going for a couple but, thousand years. What, people debating what I it. find is, is that just like there's a, a personal expression of God, God being personal, there's, there's an aspect of God that is will. And so the difference is, is that usually we believing we're a separate one. Here's my will. I have this will. And versus if you 
rather than following that right away, if you just sit down and you receive from them, you come this dark, wide open receiving. If there's a will, the will from this deeper will takes over and, and expresses itself. So I would say that ultimately God has a will, but sometimes that God will can be used via what we think of as the personal will. But usually the personal will is sort of something that just is in the way. I mean, like I, when I teach or do satsang, I mean, I, this, this, this rainbow in here doesn't have a clue. <laughs> it's just receiving, and it's almost like being a, on the telegraph wire. Okay, say this, say this. And I'm always like, like amazed. Sometimes the mind says, don't say that. And it says, no, it's coming through. And I'm always <laughs> amazed. Wow, look at how that worked. How did I do that? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, so there is, a, it, to me, will is a, an aspect of the divine. It has a will. How could all this stuff arise without a will? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes I've thought or spoken in terms of individual will and divine will and getting the two of them to sort of, you know, be in tune with one or having your individual will in tune with the will of God. But when you think about it, the way you just expressed it was beautiful. It's like, when you really do that, is there really any individual will left, or is it just the will of God functioning through um, an individual structure or expression, you know, as, yeah. as, which has become a pure instrument of the divine? Yeah. It's a kind of a, I think, more clear way of thinking about it. Yeah, so the, the question is sort of falls, <laughs> falls apart in a way. <laughs> yeah. Let thy will be done, you know, mm -hmm. on earth as it is in heaven. And then you, you know, well, I don't know, feel free to, I'm just sort of riffing here and thoughts are <laughs> coming to mind, you know, I don't know why, it's not my will. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we'll see where it goes, Rick. <laughs> but feel free to interject, interject anything that comes to mind. But I mean, you know, now I'm using the G word and talking about God, and some people have a problem with that because they think, oh, how could any loving God, you know, allow all the horror to exist in the world, which exists and all the suffering and the Holocaust and all the terrible things that happen. Um, and in light of the conversation we've just been having, you know, I would say that it's uh, a f those things are a reflection of humanity's immaturity and it's, it's estrangement from that divine intelligence such that, you know, people are going off on, on tangents with a very partial picture of the whole and creating all kinds of trouble for themselves and others. And that, you know, the, the idea of on earth as it is in heaven would be a, a situation in which, you know, en masse, all of us, billions of us, would be so attuned to the divine that, you know, uh, we'd have a very different world and no one would accuse, would need to accuse God anymore of being, uh, of being uh, you know, cruel <laughs> or heartless because we wouldn't see all these horrible things happening. I don't yeah. know, just that just came to mind. So feel free to right. comment. Well, the the problem of what we call evil in the world. Why would God permit evil in the world? <laughs> it's yeah. all his fault, right, or her fault, whatever. Um, the um, boy, I had it, and I just lost it. I went blank. Why would God permit evil in the world? It's all his fault, her fault. Right. Um, right. Well, it's you sort of hit it. Well, oh, that's where I wanted to go first. You know, sometimes I watch. Um, these um nature films you know oh, yeah. where they animals show the animals eat each other and stuff right right yeah. you go oh kangaroo i hope it can get away from the dingo dog come on come on and then <laughs> 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 it's, you know it's like in nature in nature if you look as beautiful and peaceful it is it's eating each other apart i mean it's sure. uh, devouring itself red in tooth and claw some right. poet wrote right and we, you know, we as humans, we have that animal nature, again, the survival instinct, I need to get mine. And I think, again, I, I, I think animals have a connection to this too. I'm not one of those that says that animals can't know being, because I think they do. In some ways, I think they know it more than we do. But, but we have this ability to actually consciously know we 
we can rise above this dog eat dog world, so to speak. You know, we know how to grow food. We we kill the animals to eat the meat or whatever. If you eat meat, um, we're killing vegetables. We're still devouring things, but we have this ability to you know, feed everybody in the world, right? I mean, if you know you're connected, that everything is you. When you create harm out there, and trust me, sometimes I can create some harm out there. I don't mean to, but but when I create harm out there, it's almost like it's hurting my own body. It stops me short. Something bigger is governing me. And so to me, while there's still going to be mishaps in the world, if everyone knew this, that we think twice, three times, ten times over before we would deny an immigrant to come over the border. You know, we do something about the problems in Central America because it's all us. And but um, but again, to me, you know, this world, this play can never be perfect. It's like to even have this play, you have to have black and white. You have to have good and evil. If you don't have those opposites, there's nothing here. That's that's the um, difficulty of existence. Yeah, I've thought along those same lines many times. Um, if you're going to have a relative existence, then there have to be relative qualities. And that means it can't all be sort of perfect, you know, love and joy and beauty, uh, you know, with so to an infinite degree. There needs to be a, a spectrum, a span, fast, slow, big, small, heavy, light, you know, um, all the different polarities. And... Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe God could have done it differently, but didn't. And so, so we kind of sort of face it as it is. And, yeah. And everything goes in cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are you know, very beautiful light times and heavenly times and then very dark times. I mean, a time will come when the sun will expand and become a red giant and the earth will melt. It's not right. going to be real pretty as that begins to happen. <laughs> but well, the bright side is that the climate deniers will finally admit we've got a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, back then they will. Yeah. But they'll say, see, it wasn't man-made. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, you know, that, and that to me is an absurdity in itself. I mean, the writing's on the wall and there's a solution to it. But yet, you know, the greed and the fear keep that from happening. Um, but the thing of it is, is that to, when we know that this is a passing play, it's very important in the moment. It's very important to act as if it's you you know, that it's your body to take care of, that, you know, to act out of love. But ultimately, it's to see, I am more than this passing show. I am this vastness that can never be destroyed because this world's come and go. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't take action for this one. But, you know, if God destroys a planet, the planet gets destroyed. Eventually, like you say, the sun is going to get so big, it's going to melt this planet anyway. It's only a matter of time. Sure, but it's not doing that now, and therefore right. we should destroy we, we the planet. We should do it. Yeah, we should take action. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we should take care of the garden, so to speak. It's interesting that what you're saying now, I've actually heard, there was a, there was a so-called spiritual teacher whom I had interviewed, whose interviews I've take, since taken down because I discovered the following, which was that quite a few years ago, uh, he was doing some really incorrigible things, uh, but one of the milder things he did was press young women into service as strippers, telling them that the world is an illusion and doesn't matter what you do with your body. And, uh, you know, you know, we need income for our little spiritual group. And so just go and do this. And the people in the audience are all ignorant. They don't know what you know. And so you can do it and yada, yada. So profound, beautiful spiritual teachings can be corrupted and twisted. Uh, and I think maybe the thing to prevent that from happening is what you were just saying, which is that if you really are experiencing unity, then um, you do see the world as yourself and you would not inflict harm on anything. To do so would be to even to harm yourself. Um, and you feel that you sort of have this empathy with everything that develops. You know, as Jesus said, whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. Yeah, well, that's, again, someone can open very, very widely in the head center 
and yet their belly and their heart is not so open. So all of a sudden, they become what um, I think some call an enlightened ego because they don't have the belly and the heart tempering. You know, basically, it's just a, it's a continual wearing down. You just get more and more humble. You know, who is doing it? It's just, I am a servant. And how can you harm somebody? Even when you're harming, you know, it's, it stops you short. I mean, we all do it. We're not perfect. But to do what that teacher was doing, I mean, clearly there's, there's a shadow side that hasn't been met. There's probably sides of him that are totally open that the people are attracted to. But then there's this shadow side. I think we call that the, the sick guru. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, I mean, people wonder sometimes why I take down interviews. There's another guy who I listened to a recording of him recently or made recently. And he was saying, oh, everybody in the world is, they're all ignorant monkeys. And you should just do whatever you feel like doing. Adultery is just fine if you feel like committing adultery, especially men. Men, men should be able to do it because it's their nature. And the, the guy has slept with about a thousand women, allegedly, and, uh, and treated them in very incorrigible ways. Um, so I just get pissed off at this kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> and I hear a lot of it because of the position I'm in. And I just feel like that there needs to be a higher standard in the spiritual community. And when I hear beautiful teachings being corrupted uh, and bastardized in order to fulfill somebody's, you know, small mindedness, um, it just kind of gets my hackles up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's disturbing. Well, at least that guy was up front with him. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like, what was it Trumpo Rinpoche used to um, oh, teach man. with a bottle of gin by his side? At least you knew what you're getting with him. Yeah, you knew what you were getting. It. Why anybody stuck around, <laughs> but, I don't know. But <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there's there are some profound teachings that came on him. I don't there know. Were. There yeah. were. So, you know, it's a mixed bag. It's just, you know, if you know what you're getting into, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't want to go there. But it's a mystery why that still happens with some folks. You know, but they, one problem, though, and I hear this too, is people say, well, I don't like the sound of that. It doesn't make sense to me. But hey, this guy is supposed to be enlightened and he's kind of impressive. You know, he's articulate. He seems to have some kind of energy radiating off of him. Therefore, I will doubt my own common sense and just continue to go along with this thing. And right. you, you can go way down the rabbit hole thinking that way. Right. You have to trust your gut. You have to trust what you know. Yeah. Yeah. You have to feel what is going on. If it feels a little off, <laughs> get the well, hell Tom, out. I don't mean to take up so much of the time of your interview, um, getting on my soapbox here, and, you know, <laughs> ranting and raving about these things that annoy me. So let's get back to you for a bit. We have a little okay. time left. Um, let's, and, and that'll get us back to ending on a much sweeter and more more uplifting <laughs> note. <laughs> yeah, we were going into the pit, weren't we? Yeah, well, yeah. it's important to look at all that stuff because it's part of, you know, part of our experience. What do we do with that? Yeah. And the spiritual world that people who listen to the show are all involved in can be a bit of a, a landmine. You know, what do they call it? Minefield with, where you don't know what, you know, there's, there's all kinds of pitfalls and dangers and you have to sort of learn to navigate it safely. Mm -hmm. and use discrimination. That's probably the key word right there, is culture discrimination. Yeah, you learn how to right. trust your own common sense. <clears throat> anyway, see, how it's, I'm getting back into it. Um, <laughs> so. Well, it's a, it's a big subject, you know, that one is, a, um, it's, it's hard, you know, when you see, you know, first you see all the beauty that's coming out of somebody and then all of a sudden, you know, these little shadow elements come up and usually you want to deny it because you don't want to look at that, right? Yeah. And it's... Well, this loops back to something you said earlier, which is that we're all works in progress, you know, and it, it behooves us to remember that and to continue progressing and doing the things need, that are necessary to continue progressing. You know, that's right. I mean, really, it's to acknowledge that we always have this idea of perfection you know we want to be perfect and not imperfect so it's 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 neither it's like everything we have black and white it's either perfect or not perfect we're we're a mixed bag but when you start to have inflict pain upon the world you know there there's something off there you know that's not a teacher to follow it's at least maybe 
take the the good advice and then get the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> There's that song by the band, you take what you need, but you leave the rest. That's right. <laughs> <clears throat> um, okay, so how are things with you these days, Tom? What are you doing for a living? What am I doing for a living? Are you a full-time teacher now, or do you have like a, a job still, or what? I left, I was doing um, building construction part-time while I was teaching part-time. And I, I was a licensed contractor in the state. That's a long story. But, um, but I gave that up at the beginning of the year. I just, um, it takes too much away from the teaching. And my body's getting too old to work out in the hot sun and everything. And it was just done. I still need to fix up my house. So I get busy with that. But um, so I am um, trying to teach full time. And you know, we live pretty cheap. We're, we're, we try to approach low middle class if we're lucky. <laughs> but what we've been doing pretty well the last few years. We've got all our debt paid off. And Good. Still driving an old car, 1988 Toyota Tercel. Oh, that's really old. But no, this, this is my gig is pretty much just teaching now. Great. Well, I hope you get a nice bump from the, the interview. And, yeah. You know, yeah. I hope so. I hope it's not too big. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can we'll it. see. I can yeah. handle it. <laughs> and and in terms of your personal, um, you know, development, um, you know, what do you, what kind of stuff do you feel like you're going through these days, and what what seems to be on the horizon? Well, Although you can never tell for sure what's on the horizon. Yeah, you never know what's around the corner, do we, Rick? But it's to me, it's. I think a lot of the a lot of my growth comes through the teaching. Uh, sometimes I tell people. In fact, I tell people a lot. You think I'm the teacher? I feel like I'm the student. Oh yeah. That you're teaching me. Mm. You yeah. know, it's it's it, it, it's an interchange. Don't count yourself short. In fact, what you're seeing in me that you emulate, rather than saying it's coming from me, it's it's a reflection of something that's already inside you, or otherwise you wouldn't see it. Uh, so. It's just, I think what's going on is just, it's just a deeper, deeper collapse into just letting what the aliveness that's behind this form, that's that's moving this essence as itself, as the drop in the ocean, so to speak, is it just, it just keeps, for lack of a better word, deepening. And yet what is, isn't going anywhere, it's not deepening, but yet its expression keeps expressing itself closer and closer to its love basically sure and um that's pretty much what i think my gig is right now is is moving in that direction and you know i still live a life you know i hang out with my wife we garden you know every once in a while we might go to a party but we're not big partiers um we do watch television sure <laughs> i will admit to that and so um do I. Just another thing, and um, not going to have any more cats. We're, we're just done with that. We're tired of cleaning up, throw up on the floor, and putting them down when they get old. Um, but um, just um, cruising along and seeing where it takes us. Do you feel like um, that functioning in the role of a teacher increases the voltage for you? Um, that, oh yeah, you know, because you're in this role, it's sort of like I don't know who or what or the, the powers that be, so to speak, say, "Okay, boys, we got a live one here. Let's give them some juice." <laughs> <laughs> well, what's interesting on that, you know, I'll do these four or five day retreats, and then you'll know, you know do like solo gigs, you know. But the um, you, you retreats for you or retreats for with students that you teach retreats with students that I teach. I, see, I, I, I haven't see. gone on anybody's retreat for quite some time now. I'm not against it, but it hasn't happened. So usually a, a few days, sometimes a week. I can you know how when your body, if you're you're going to get on the airplane, it goes someplace, and it, you know a few days before the body starts to brace. You know, you, you may not be anxious about it, but you can feel there's a subtle bracing, which is a good thing. Otherwise, you'd never make it to the plane, right? <laughs> and so a lot of times there'll be like, um, I think the structure, you know, the structure just wants to hang out and be a normal kind of guy, you know, and just put around basically <laughs> or take care of what needs to be taken care of. 
And so a few days before a retreat, usually there's a, there's a bracing, like, uh-oh, the voltage is going to amp up. Mm-hmm. And because when I do retreats, it's like there's so much energy running through, probably three quarters of it I don't even know is there. And so usually that the form feels a fatigue. It's like, okay, where we're going to go this and where is it going to go? Something is going to, you know, more windows, more doors are going to open up. Um, so the retreats, the teaching in general, like you said, it, it, it juices things up. Um, yeah. It's, I think it accelerates your own, your own evolution yeah. to, to do it. Right. Um, yeah. So it's my Dharma right now. If you want to learn something, teach it. Right. Right. I'm always learning something. There's always, I mean, I hate to boast, but, <laughs> you know, whatever comes through here is getting pretty darn good at it. It just knows the right thing to ask at the right time. Not that I don't slip up, but when I slip up, it's sort of funny. It's like, oh, that didn't work. Let's go this way. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, it, it doesn't sound like you're boasting. It's like, you, you know, devote your life to anything and eventually you get good at it. And you've been devoting a good many years of your life to this stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It, it has found me. Like I said, they, they found me and said, no, you're going to teach. So here I am. So now I'm hooked. Yeah. Um, no more questions are coming to mind. Is there anything that you would like to cover that we haven't covered that I haven't thought to ask you or that, you know, you'd thought before this interview that maybe we'd get into? Hmm. Well, I covered the, you know, the belly, the felt sense and the head center. We've gone over that and it, you know, it all commingles ultimately in the heart. To me, the heart is the um, place where the, you know, the head, the spaciousness meets the substantiality. Um, you know, where, where that's where the love is, that's where the connection is. Um, but, you know, I don't think I have anything more that I had pre planned. You know, you could spark something. You know, if you oh, want. I probably could. Well, this, this heart thing is a nice thing to end on because, um, who was it? Jack Cornfield, I think he said it. he wrote a book called A Path with Heart. And, I uh, just got that book at a used bookstore the other day. Uh, that is a beautiful book. I just started reading that. But go on, I interrupted you. No, that's okay. Um, but just I think, you know, the, a lot of the things we've been talking about, about the, the potential pitfalls and, and, uh, and side tracks and whatnot that one could fall into, I think, if, I think the heart has a protective value uh, against all that stuff. You know, if there's a sort of a, a culturing of the heart, it, um, it safeguards the path to a great extent. Yeah. You're correct, because what the heart does, the heart loves everything, the heart feels everything. When you're feeling everything, you, you're guided. You know, oh, there's something off there. Move this away. You know, I, I think the key is, you know, if anything to take away from this interview is the willingness to receive rather than to go out there, to receive first and then move you know, the, the yin quality versus the yang. You know, we're such a, a go get them culture. We're going to pull myself up my bootstraps and make this, <laughs> this, and this happen. It's like, how about receiving first and see what wants to guide you versus, you, you know, going out there. and Yeah, rather than you trying to call the shots. Right, right. And so when you receive, the more you receive, you know, everything starts to come to you. So when something's off, you receive that. You go, ooh. I don't know if I like this. You know, the sensitivity just grows. Um, I can remember years ago, this was, you know, post-awakening in 2000 when I had this um, executive management job, which, by the way, I was thrown into right after waking up. <laughs> go, go figure, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I think I'm going to go be a meditator or whatever, and all of a sudden I'm in this power job. Um, but anyway, my point being is one time I had to write an evaluation for somebody and she was like my lieutenant and she was really good, but boy, she could really slam people if she didn't get her way or they, they slacked off or whatever. And so I had to, my boss said, you have to write this, you have to bring this up. We just got information from other people, how bad she's been treating them. 
And so I, I, had, I was supposed to give the evaluation the next day. And so I'm going at it. I got to get this done the next day. I got to get this. I wasn't receiving. I got to, you know, here are the conditioning says you got to meet the deadline. You got to get done. There's the interview, right? Um, here's the evaluation interview coming up. And yet at the same time, if I'd been listening, I would have felt in my gut, you know, it's like something's off, something's off. But I wouldn't listen to that. I kept going. It's like you, you just got to keep receiving and listening and stopping. What is going on? Because if I had listened to that, I would have taken a bunch of more days. I would have talked it over with my boss because the evaluation was a disaster. You know, she got very defensive, you know, put a big schism between us. And the information was there if I had stopped and listened. So now I'm better at it. I'm getting better at it. <laughs> But, but so receiving is the key it's to stop and listen and then move yeah when you say that it kind of gives me i get the sense of kind of a softness gentleness um almost reminds me of carlos castaneda's books you know where there was a whole lot of emphasis on <clears throat> you know um awareness and, and Don Juan used the term stalking where you're just kind of um, you know attentive and attuned to every little nuance that that happens around you and and yeah. open to the potential significance of it yeah every little thing you start to see is giving you information is is I think as the Sufis say you know every expression is God revealing itself to itself so every little thing has meaning you start to see the littlest things. You start to see that a crack across the room actually moves you. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's nice. All right. Well, let's leave that for people to ponder. Yeah, that's a good um, place. <laughs> a crack yeah. across the room will move you. <laughs> <laughs> um, earlier on, uh, Hannah from Portland, Oregon, uh, sent in a note saying, Tom, please don't forget to mention that you teach here in Portland, too. <laughs> yeah, that's so, my Hannah. Yeah. Um, Hannah. yeah, thank you, Hannah. Um, I do have a next, um, this coming, is it Saturday? This coming Friday and Saturday, I will be doing, you know, an evening and an all day event up in Portland. And Hannah, it's going to be at Hannah's house, her sweet little house. And um, the information's on my website there in the home page. You should be able to find it. Yeah, and you mentioned that you have a group in Charlottesville, Virginia, and that you actually go there once in a while. So theoretically, anybody who's listening to this could get together a group in their area, and you could go there too. Yeah, that can work. That's how that one happened. They found me, and I talked with them, and they came out here first, Michael and Heather. Um, very sweet people. He runs a mattress company, a, a natural organic savvy rest. So if you ever want a nice natural mattress, go to Savvy Rest. There, yeah, there's a promotion for Michael. Like that. <laughs> you get a commission. <laughs> yeah, I'll get a commission. <laughs> but, um, but um, yeah, I'm out open to you know if someone wants to host me. It's it's great. I you know more connection, and then this online thing, the online internet's so incredible. How you know it's not only the technology. When I do an event online, especially with the Virginia people. It's like I, there's no space, there's no time. I feel like I'm right there. It's not the computer. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I feel that with this too, you know, doing yeah. these things. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you you do some really good work. I'm amazed you can do one a week, man. That's a you're a busy guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's balanced, and I have a lot of help. Yeah. I mean, you do have a crew. And various others helping. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, good. Thanks, Tom. It's been a nice conversation. Really appreciated it. Yeah. Well, um, let me make a couple of wrap-up points. So, um, you know, I've been speaking with Tom Kurska. I'll be linking to his website. And uh, obviously, he's been explaining what he does. And you can get in touch if you're interested. I'm sure there's a way of doing that through your website, right? Yes, there's information, email, phone. Yeah. And uh, hope that everyone's enjoyed this interview. I have. And... Um, Next week, I'll be interviewing an Indian fellow named Shyamji Bhatnagar, who talks about micro chakras. I haven't quite figured out how to tackle that one yet, but I'll, <laughs> I'll be learning about it next week. Um, and there's some other very interesting ones coming up in the future. There's a 
a very sweet older woman. She's 91 years old and when, named Dorothy Wal, Wal, Walters or Waters? Walters. Walters. And when she was 51, not having any kind of interest in spiritual development or anything else, it wasn't her thing. She had this blowout Kundalini awakening, just really profound, dramatic shift. And she's, you know, she spent the next 40 years um, kind of like coming to terms with that and then enjoying it and at the same time building a whole body of knowledge to explain what happened to her. Um, so there's no end of fascinating people to talk to and we'll continue to have this program for the foreseeable future. Um, if people would like to be notified, if you'd like to be notified uh, when new ones are posted, subscribe on YouTube and you could also subscribe to the little email thing on batgap.com. There's also an audio podcast if you'd like to listen while you commute or whatever. So you can subscribe to that on iTunes or Stitcher, or one of those services. And there's a page for that on Batgap. So check it out. And uh, thanks for listening or watching. And thanks again, Tom. Well, thank you, Rich, for having me. I mean, Rich. Rick. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, your real name's Richard, right? Your legal? It is, right. Yeah, yeah okay. Well, you're Rick. Sorry about that. Yeah, well, I'm I not know. exactly rich, so Rick, Rick is probably more appropriate. <laughs> Rick Rich, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a good friend that came through town the other day. His name was Rich. So I think that's where the, flip, the slip it, came from. Yeah. No problem. yeah, but thank you so much. It's been a yeah. real Thanks. joy to meet good you. Good spending with. time with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, say hi to your wife. Okay, will do. Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.